In this video, I explain how getting deployed works, what you can expect, and answer your questions in this long form Adjuster TV video. Starting now. This is Adjuster TV. Hey, it's Matt here with Adjuster TV. For the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe now. Click on the bell notification so that you never miss a video. And thanks to Jason who sent me an email saying, keep those videos rolling. They sure made my job easier when I was getting into this. Thank you so much for watching, Jason. Okay, this is a long one full of great information, but before we jump in, just a quick heads up that you can now find Xactimate training at adjustertv.com. All right, let's jump in. Ask your questions in the chat. Just put your questions in the chat. And once I get through kind of talking about this stuff, um, I'll just scroll through and start picking questions out. I mean, anything at all you guys can think of uh, regarding being deployed, um, kind of this is sort of the pre-deployment part of the, the hurricane part, right? Everybody's on standby. We're a couple days out still from the hurricane making landfall. They, they're showing it, doing all kinds of things, right? Right now, it's going up the coast, right? Tomorrow this time, it could be going to the Keys. It's, you know, who knows? It's just a thing. So anyway, um, what's up, Marion? Um, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and just get started with this. Um, I think the last thing I looked at with uh, Dorian was that it was, um, it's going to move super duper slow. So right now, today, it's what? three o'clock on Saturday, the 31st. And I don't think that they've got it getting anywhere close to the U S coast, whether it's Florida or the Carolinas, you guys probably know more. I didn't look at this. I've looked at this for like half an hour, but it could, certainly could have been updated. They don't have it getting anywhere near the coast until like Tuesday, maybe even Wednesday. That's several days. And you probably could tell this time yesterday, they had a line going straight through Florida, right? And now they got it going up in a big elbow. Tomorrow, the next day, we got Sunday, Monday. You know, that's two days where anything can happen, right? And this looks like it's a, it could be a pretty uh, serious storm. So obviously, as human beings and as citizens, we don't want people to have to suffer through this. But we are trained to do this job. This is what we're here for. We're like the fire department, right? The fire department doesn't pray for people's houses to catch on fire, but they train for it, and when it happens, they're throwing their jackets on, and they're grabbing their Dalmatian and their axe, and they're jumping in the truck, and they're going. That's their job. They're excited. This is their thing, right? They're going to go help somebody because fire is going to happen, um, and it's a good thing that the fire department is there. We're kind of like – sort of like the fire department in a way in that we're going to help people recover from an event like this. This is – you know, if it, if it makes landfall full force with – uh, in, a, in a highly populated area, there's going to be a lot of people that are out of their homes. They're going to have severe damage. Um, any, any of you who have done any daily work, you know that if you've got a water spot on your ceiling right here like this, or the toilet overflows and causes damage in the bathroom downstairs and part of the closet, that can take weeks to get that straightened out, right? Um, Imagine if the whole house is soaking wet all the way through, like all the drywalls hanging off the walls. Every single piece of personal property that they own is ruined. Everything, is, they might as, the house might as well have burned down, right? That's how severe some of these, these storms like this can be, especially with the storm surge. And even with wind, wind blows the roof off, rains in, and everything's ruined, right? Um, so just to kind of like temper expectations, to kind of, to kind of calibrate your expectations a little bit, as... An experienced cat property adjuster. I have been deployed to six hurricanes. Gene, Ivan, well, Ivan was the first one, Gene, Katrina, Ike, Sandy, and Irma, right? I have been put on standby for probably, I would say, between 30 and 40 hurricanes, right? There are dozens of hurricanes that do what, what uh, Dorian may or may not do. And they're massive category five. They come barreling in and they get three hours from the coast and evaporate. Or they turn around and go right straight back out to sea. And it's a footnote in history. Nobody knows about Hurricane Zeke. That was a category 25 or whatever it was because it didn't do anything to anybody except for maybe some fishermen offshore, right? Which their lives probably sucked. The expectation is, is that what I'm saying here is that even though you're on standby, right, which is great, um, 
you're not on the storm until you're on the storm, right? Until they say, okay, we see that we've got uh, the eye of the hurricane, the worst part of the storm, just mowed right through the middle of Miami or Fort Lauderdale or whatever it is. And we have 250,000 claims that we know of right now in that area. There's no way the structures in that area could possibly have survived. Start driving to Florida. You'll get claims assigned to you on the way, or you've got claims assigned to you right now. If they want you to go to an induction center, then that means you're deployed. That means it's the get, it's on. If you remember, some of you may or may not remember this from last year, uh, the caveat and part of the calibration with this is, is even if that happens, even if they stage you up and they, they you go through orientation and you have a few days of day rate, they'll pay a day rate, uh, a lot of companies will, to, to go to orientation and to hang out and wait for the storm to pass and for the claims to start coming in. Last year on Hurricanes Florence and Michael, there were a lot of people who did all that. They got standby call. You know, the call came in. They got super excited. They packed all their stuff up. You know, they maybe even stopped by Home Depot or Best Buy on the way there to buy more gear. They got to the Carolinas and got 10 claims. They did 10 claims and they said, all right, well, that's all we need you for. And they sent them home, right? That can happen. It's, these things are, it's not... You're not going to make the big money onto the claim until you've like got those all those claims in your hand, right? They, they give you 70 claims, or they give you 40, and they're like, as soon as you can get those done, I've got a gigantic stack more to give to you, right? That's when when that happens, then that's it, right? Being on standby doesn't mean a whole lot. It's basically the IA firms are wanting to commit to. Uh, you guys can still hear me, okay? Um, the IA firm or the carriers are wanting the IA firms to commit to being able to, to provide X number of uh, adjusters depending on the policies policies and force that they have in the area. So if all state or you know or citizens or whoever has got two million people in an area, they know that they need two thousand adjusters or whatever it is, right? So they're going to call the IA firms that they have that they have contracts with and say, hey, can you give us 200 e 200 I uh, independent adjusters or 600 independent adjusters. IFRM says, oh yeah, absolutely, sure. And they're like pointing to the other guy to get on the phone and start sending out standby requests, right? So that's what standby means. They want, because they're being asked to make a commitment to the carrier, they're wanting to get a commitment from you so that they can, when, when the deployment call comes, when the carrier says, all right, we're good to go. We have a bazillion claims sitting here, send your adjusters, right? So that, that IA firm can now call you and say, all right, I have you on standby, go. Right. Or when technically what will happen is, is that they'll if you're on standby with somebody, they'll say they'll call you and they say, OK, are you you're on. We have you on standby for Dorian. You still want to go. Right. So like they'll still kind of like give you a little bit of a, an out in, in a way, I think probably because a lot of the IA firms get kind of burned because a lot of you guys are probably on standby uh, with more than one company. And you're going to go with the, the first company that calls, or you're going to wait for the company that you want to go with to call you. Um, I did a little Facebook Live about this last night. Um, it's hard to say not to do that if you're brand new and, and you want to maximize your opportunities for getting deployed. As an as an experienced adjuster, I'm not going to do that because I know that if pilot calls me or you know paysetter or Minerac, whoever calls me, and they say, Matt, we've got this 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 uh, carrier that's got some it's a bunch of commercial stuff. Do you want to go? I'm going to say, yeah. And that's who I'm going to go with. I'm like, anybody else that calls, I'll say, I'm already locked in with this person, right? So I'm going to go with, with the person I want to go with. They may, you know, somebody may call me and I don't want to go with them. And I'll be like, uh, no, I'll, you know, I'll call you. You know, I'll, I'll just, I have that power because I'm, I'm an experienced veteran adjuster and I've got a reputation. So, um, but as new people, you know, they kind of understand. People are going to come and they're going to go and they're going to, if they are asked for a thousand adjusters, they may try to put, a 2000 on standby, knowing that a bunch of them aren't going to, it's not going to be, a, they're not going to go, right? They're going to either back out and just say, I don't want to go, or, I'm too scared or whatever, or sorry, I went with this other company called me first. It happens all the time. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, but so next thing, if you are currently deployed on a cat, right? If you're on a hail deployment and I, I know there's people in Montana, there's people working in Wyoming, there's people working in, uh, I think, Illinois, there's people working in Minnesota, and all, there's, there's a lot of deployments out there. If you're currently 
on cat right now and you're getting claims and you're still, it's like you're on a storm basically. I'm going to strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you stay there, right? Because I'll tell you the reasons why, right? So number one, a claim is a claim is a claim, right? So a win claim in Florida is going to be a claim just like a hail claim in Denver, right? Um, if you leave one storm that's got good volume and, and you're making money and you're like locked into it and you've made a commitment to it to go to another storm because you think it's going to be better, um, it's going to be, if I was your manager and you called me, I was your store manager and, and we were in Minneapolis and you said, hey, listen, you know, I really want to go. I, they're, they're, they're calling me to go on standby. So I, I'm on standby with with uh, Acme claims or whatever. So, you know, when they call, I'm going to go, right? I'm going to look, I'm going to immediately jump into exact analysis and look at your pending and see where you're at. I'm going to be like, listen, you've got 21 claims open right now. I can't, you can't leave, right? So, and even if you didn't have that many, if I have a lot of volume and I've got, just the right number of adjusters there to help me close those claims to help me fulfill our contractual as i affirm our contractual obligation to the carrier in minneapolis i need five adjusters there to handle the claims that are coming in and if you leave or you and two other people leave then i'm hooped right i'm gonna have to start calling around frantically to find people to fill in where you were and i'm not going to be your friend on the next time i see you on cat i'm gonna be like this guy mr take off and go, you know, to the hurricane where he only got 37 claims and then came crawling back trying to get back on the storm. And sorry, we already gave all these other claims to somebody else. Anything can happen. But long story short with this, a bird in the hand right now, if you're deployed and, and you're not, your storm is winding down and they're like, well, you know, just whenever you feel like wrapping up, you know, the, the volume's super low, you know, you can, you know, just Call me and we'll cut you off and, and you can go go home and do whatever, right? This storm is about done anyway, right? If they're not saying that, if you are locked into the storm, stay there. Because bird in hand, that bird is worth 100 in the bush for sure, especially with the way these hurricanes go. If you, if they, if you get called on to go on standby today and that storm is not, not scheduled to make landfall until Tuesday, then you could really screw yourself uh, if you if you bail on a hailstorm or some other storm where you're they need you to work and you've got good volume coming in, then you're going to be stuck without that storm and without this one if this one turns around and goes back out to sea, right? It doesn't do anything. So stay where you are. Don't try to get off the deployment that you're on because they need you there, right? Um, it's a great way to burn a bridge or at least, you know, get dirty looks and, and get maybe passed over as people are deploying for other events, right, in the future. Um, however, if you are on daily claims right now, it's a slightly different story. IA firms, like if you're doing dailies and wherever you are, you know, we'll just say Chicago, um, and you're getting two to five claims a week, when big hurricanes come and big of it, like wildfires and stuff come along, they are daily companies that are, that are giving you daily claims are probably kind of expecting that you're going to, so at least some number of adjusters that they have in Chicago doing those daily claims are going to leave and go on the storm, right? They're going to go do CAT because the CAT's extra money. And as long as they've got a good relationship, you'd probably, probably be pretty cool. Some, I, and I've talked to several IA firms about this and I've had like four out of five say, oh yeah, no problem. Just let us know. And if you've got claims in hand, like if you if we just, if I just assigned you five claims and you've got them scheduled, do those claims, right? Try to get those done before you, I, you know, you, I'll cut you off right now. I'm not going to give you any more claims. Wrap up everything that you have as best you can. And, you know, I may still ask you, like, once you're on your way to Florida, if you get down to Florida in a week, just kind of, if, if insureds are calling you, kind of try to help me out with those because it's, if I'm your, your admin manager or your, your manager in Chicago, for your daily claims and everybody everybody but you know eight out of ten of my adjusters leave then i still have to i still have those, cl those claims aren't going away right they're not going to stop just because there's a hurricane so um that pr uh, kind of presents a bit of an opportunity on the other hand right so if everybody like say this this thing hits and it just smashes right through florida and it turns and goes up through New Orleans and it goes back down to sea and it goes over and hits Houston. I mean, it just wrecks everything. Every single adjuster in the whole country is going to be on the coast, right? It's going to be like Harvey, Harvey and Irma. And this is what happened with those storms. 
the daily claims are still coming in. You can, you can probably get marriage proposals, free steak dinners for life. I mean, just you name it. If you if you call your IA firm and you're doing daily claims in Chicago or whatever, and you say, hey, listen, I you know, I'm watching the news. You know, I'm gonna stay here. I know you got guys that are leaving. Just load me up, and they will load you up, and you will be probably busier or at least as busy doing daily claims with all the extra volume from all those other adjusters that left in Chicago, where Denver, it doesn't matter, um, as the guys that went all down to the coast. And your manager is going to love you so much if you do that, because they still, as I firms that do those daily claims, still have a contractual obligation to uh, service whatever claims that they've agreed to, right? And if all the adjusters leave, then the IA firm is is kind of screwed. So they have to find people to fill in or they're going to like just jack up the volume for everybody else who, who decides that they want to stay behind. And I'll tell you this, a hail claim or a water claim in Minneapolis uh, is going to be, to me, to my mind, and I'm not telling you guys not to go, I'm just making a statement. If I have a choice between like, riding out a hail storm through November, right? That's got good hail and it's in a good area and the claims are pretty big um, or going and dealing with the high heat and humidity, the lack of resources and all that stuff. If I'm locked into a hail storm, I'm not leaving that storm. I'm gonna be happy as a claim because I'm gonna get more claims because a lot of people that I'm with, that deployed with are gonna leave and go to the coast. I'm gonna be busy, so busy. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna make so much money on that hail storm because I'm gonna get a bunch of extra claims. So. I would say that hurricanes are great if you're brand new and you don't have any other deployment opportunities, you're not deployed on a, on a cat right now and you're not doing any daily work right now, um, go out, you know, if, if you think you're ready and we're gonna, we can talk about that, all the questions that you guys have about this. So we're gonna talk about right now today. Um, if you think you're ready to do this, then that's what we're gonna talk about here today, right now. So that's my little, spiel to start off with um let me uh zip through here real quick okay so josh so here's how a, a deployment works uh josh josh asks uh after the standby when will we we be told where we have to go for work so basically what will happen is is this it's assuming the storm does you know, it does hit the coast and it does cause it. We're going to assume that this is like we're on, right? It's game on with the, the house is burning down, so to speak, because we're the firefighters, right? Um, what will happen is, is that uh, you're on standby, right? Get some focus. Um, they're ready to activate you. They're going to, they're going to call you or they're going to text you. They'll probably call you and they'll say, okay, we're good to go. If you want to go deploy with us, um, this is this is the real deal. You know, I need you to go to Mobile, Alabama, or I need you to go to Charleston, or I need you to go to Savannah, wherever they need you to go, and check in at the induction center. You know, some of the bigger companies are going to have they'll rent out like a gymnasium or something, and they'll have like a huge orientation center, or induction center, where they'll intake all of the adjusters. <clears throat> That's where you're going to go, and get your shirts, get some, a little extra remedial training, orientations all over the place, you know, get your ID badges and make sure your laptops are good to go and all that stuff, right? So basically, um, after the storm passes, or if it looks like it's just getting, I mean, it's it's going to do it, they'll probably start making calls. They'll probably start sending, saying, hey, just start moving in that direction, right? And then we'll call you again uh, in 24 hours or, or by the, by tomorrow morning or whatever and say, go here or go there, right? Because you never know with the hurricane. Um, so we'll assume that they call you and they say, good to go, head to Savannah, uh, to this address. There's a big hotel conference center and we've rented it out. We're, that's where we're doing our intake. So you're going to have to call and get a hotel. As soon as you get off the phone, start, you know, get on Expedia or whatever and try to find yourself a hotel as fast as you can or go to accommodations. Uh, oh, I forget, it's Dana's website. I'll, I'll, Try to remember it and, and link it out to you guys. But um, I, anyway, so get a hotel, right? And then because you want to lock that in before everybody else locks it in. Because if that's, if you're going there, I guaranteed six or 700 other people, or probably maybe even two or 3,000 other adjusters are all going to be going to that same place. You want to lock in a room. Um, 
Make sure you got all your gear. If you don't have all your gear, don't turn around. You can just, I mean, there's, they have stores everywhere in the U.S. You can go buy shampoo at the Target, and if they have Target down there, or Walmart or whatever. Um, you can buy a ladder down there if you need to. Um, you can, whatever you need, you can buy at stores, right? So get yourself down there. You, you check in. You can, they're going to give you your ID badge. They should have all that stuff printed out and ready for you when you get there. Um, you get uh, some companies are going to give you shirts. You may have to buy them. They're like they come out of your they take it out of your paycheck, right? Like Pilot will do this with all state shirts and Amfam shirts. Amfam's not really any hurricane states, but um, they're like thirty bucks a piece or whatever. You need to have company logo and stuff. Um, if it goes up the coast and hits, you know, like New York or up in the Northeast, and it gets cool, you know, you might get a jacket, with, you know, all state on it. Um, <clears throat> so you'll also get. Uh, a pilot at least I know does this they'll have like for all state they'll have next gen training like they'll they'll have cl all day long class where you sit there and they'll walk you all the way through how to use next gen they'll have ex like a sort of like a remedial exactimate class kind of like a crash course in exactimate goes all day long they'll have what's called a roof calibration class where they'll teach you all about the brittleness tests and the right way to do it and not how they don't want you to do it um, and then they'll have a general orientation where they will kind of like give you the over, it's a general orientation where the, the speakers will get up the, the guy who's running the whole storm will get up and talk and kind of explain what's going on just a tip for you guys if 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 a carrier person uh asks you to ask questions in one of those big meetings like not in like a training class but like in a big like orientation meeting do not ask questions write it down if you have a question about something write it down on a piece of paper or send yourself an email and go find your IA manager and ask them personally on the side. Don't waste anybody's time by asking a bunch of questions in the middle of a general orientation. People do it all the time, um, and they it, it wastes everybody's time. And they're they're good questions. I'm not going to lie, but they're better questions that you need to go to your IA manager. Always go to your IA manager for everything. Don't ever go and find an all-state person or a state farm person or a whoever person and start asking them a bunch of questions about, oh, how do I do this? Do I do? Go to your IA manager. Okay. So that's pro tip number one, right? So um, the thing is at this point, Josh, uh, is that the claims can come in at any point from when they call you to say, hey, go to Georgia or go to Florida, right? And a week, right? You could be hanging out in Savannah Go showing up at the induction center every day and taking this class or that class. They're gonna they probably pay you day rate, hopefully. And you have to sit there and kind of wait. And the reason why is because if there's if it's, a, if it's really bad devastation, they may not let the National Guard's gonna be there. They may not let people back in to the area to to assess what happened to their house, right? So it may take a few days for some basic infrastructure to get returned. For them to clear all the power lines off the road and clear all the trees off the road so that people can drive so that you know you can get there because you're going to be one of the first people in there after they get that done um hurricane katrina was like that uh i mean it's 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 when you see when you go <laughs> there's nothing like it and anybody if, you, if any of you have ever been on a hurricane or like been in, in a, a post hurricane area where it was like complete devastation it's it's a really really weird kind of eerie feeling to see that no lights are on, right? All the windows in the Taco Bell are, are gone. There's like, because the wind was so high and the water, it was raining a lot and there's all kinds of debris and stuff everywhere. Every single surface of everything, trees, uh, telephone poles, traffic lights, uh, you know, storefronts, houses, the road, everything has like dirt and debris and all kinds of stuff hanging off of it. It's like the post-apocalypse. It is weird and crazy and it's not cool. I, I, it's, it's not a good feeling because you're like, this, this doesn't feel right, right? Um, so they have to go in and clean all that, not that stuff, but they got to make the roads passable for you. So it might take several days before you actually get assigned claims. In some areas, they may, like all state may say, well, we know these guys' houses are gone. We're going to start, we're going to sign those claims right now so that people can start making phone calls. The other thing is, is that insureds may be out in hotels. They may be out of cell phone service. The towers might be down. So it's going to take, it might take a little bit of time, long story short, might take a little bit of time for you to, to actually get claims in hand, but once you do, then clock's ticking, right? As soon as they assign you claims, you, you know, if you're in Savannah and they assign you claims in Fort Myers, 
you immediately, I mean, at the second you do, unless you're in the middle of a class, you pack yourself up, jump in your truck, and you're on the highway, right? You're, you're headed that way. And you may even stop before the end of, like, you know, decent calling hours, like, you know, maybe eight or nine o'clock at the latest. Stop, call all your insureds, and, you know, touch base with them at least so that they know that you're coming, right? Um, so that's kind of how that works. You might get them right away. I mean, they might say, like I said, you know, go to Fort Myers. You've got 60 claims sitting in your queue. Um, let's get this done. It's, it's on, right? Or it might take a week. Robert asks, what is the proper way to have several commitments to IA firms? And should I let them know I'm considering my options? No. <laughs> I kind of touched on this a little bit in the beginning. Um, I would say as a new person, if, you have, if you're on standby with several companies, I'm going to say that the first company that calls you, especially if it's a big company like Pilot or Everill or Worley, um, if, if one of those guys call you and say, hey, are you ready to go? You know, I have you on standby. We're, we're ready to do this. You say, yes, I'm ready to go. You're, and now, as soon as you say that, yes, I'm ready to go. I'll be there in 24 hours. You're locked in to whoever you just talked to, right? If, if you get off the phone with Pilot and you just committed to them, you're, you're with Pilot, right? Anybody else that calls you, all you got to do is say, I can't do it. Right. I mean, you don't have to like go into a big long reason because that person's making a lot of phone calls and you don't want to waste your time with, well, you know, I was thinking about it and I kind of liked, I wanted to go with these guys, but I didn't want to go with those guys because, you know, I like the way they, these guys don't just don't just, uh, I can't. Sorry, I can't do it. Right. Um, thank you for the consideration. I'll catch you on the next one. Okay. Bye. Click and you're done. Right. There's no reason to make, have a big long conversation about it or even to worry about that conversation. If you're new, it's a bird in the hand, right? That first call, the f that first one that calls you, if it's if you want to go with that role and you call them and they're like, well, we still got you on standby, but Pilot calls you all of a sudden, go with Pilot, right? Because that role might not call. And if you're sitting around, if you pass this one up to go with this one and they're like, oh, well, we're not going to do it or there's no claims or whatever, or we we all, we have everybody we need now, you were too far down the list, then you then you're, you have empty hands, right? Go with first person that calls you. Anybody else that calls, just say, Sorry, can't do it. Um, I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you so much for your consideration. Um, I'll let you guys know when I'm ready and when I'm ready to deploy again for whatever future event there is, right? So, just, and that's it. That's all you got to say, right? Good question. Steve asks, do you think State Farm would, do, would be doing their emergency certification? Absolutely. I'll tell you a story. So, you guys know that uh, NFIP, like flood, you, they want you to have. Uh, four years or some two, two or three or four years, right, of experience as an as an adjuster handling claims before they'll let you get your NFIP certification, right, for flood. And if you don't know what NFIP is, it's a National Flood Insurance Program, which is a federal program um, that where the, the federal government helps people with flood coverage because the regular homeowners does not cover surface water or any kind of flood water at all, right? So they have to kind of, government steps in to, to make that coverage anyway. Um, on Hurricane Katrina, I was at the induction center in Mobile for pilot, and I was doing claims for Allstate. And one of those head honcho guys from pilot, I was in the middle of an orientation. No, 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 I'll take that back. That was, it was on Sandy, now I remember now, because I was, I was field support on Sandy. Um, I was standing in the back of the room watching an orientation and kind of like, you know, we had to, I had to be present for some of these, these training classes anyway. So guy walks in and he's got a couple guys behind him and just I mean, interrupts the person giving a presentation just, and just like boom, big booming voice, great big tall guy. And he goes, anybody in here want to do flood? I need 15 people right now. You want to do flood? And people are like, I mean, I don't know. It's, you don't have to have a certification. If you want to go come with me right now and turn around and walked out of the room and people are like grabbing their books and like, you know, going out the door. They, they will, they will, it's like the military, right? You want to go in and you want to drive tanks, they're going to have you scrubbing dishes, you know, right? They're going to put you where they need you to go. So don't worry about certifications. If, if you're on track to get something uh, right now, you're, that's fine. But they will, it's just like those orientation things where if you're sitting there staged up for a week, part of that is going to be them giving you a crash course in their certification. And all their certification is like a lot of insurance companies have this. It's basically, they're going to walk you through their estimating guidelines, right? This is how, you know, if you're painting a room, right? I see a window around. So this, and this window is 22 square feet. 
uh, or bigger, then I need you to subtract that measurement out of your room painting measure, right? So that's that's what they're going to do. They're going to talk about some specific policy things. They're going to basically tell you how they want you to do claims. And that's what the certificate in general. That's what those certifications are for. Um, so they're going to do that at orientation. If you if they call you, they put you on standby. I think this is the kind of harder question. If they call you and, and, and they put you on standby and then they call you again and say, okay, you're ready to go, they're not going to say, oh, and by the way, do you have your state farm certification? If you say no, oh, well, you can't go. That's not going to happen. Probably not going to happen. If, it, if the storm is bad enough, they'll be pulling people off the street, you know, and can you climb a ladder? Do you have a ladder? Then go to Florida, right? That's, that's what Katrina was like. That's what, um, absolutely, I Charlie, all those hurricanes down there in, in the 04 and 05, they were pulling people off the street. I'm sure it was the same way with Harvey and Irma. Um, so don't worry too much about getting little certifications and things like that or fretting or like saying no because you're not quite ready because you don't have that last little, just if you want to go, I'm ready to go. I got my ladder, I got my laptop, Xactimate's loaded. I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready, you know, I'm scared, I'm terrified, but I'm ready, right? And then you just go and they'll take care of everything else because they want, they want bodies down there more than anything. And it's not, they'll, they'll work with you to get you quote unquote qualified. Right, make sense? All right, okay, Todd. <laughs> well, this is this is the nature of the beast. So Todd's question is, excuse me, a lot of us newbies are going to State Farm staging in Birmingham with no clue if there will end up being claims based on the trend of the hurricane path, wondering of the likelihood that we'll be sent home with no claims. That's, you just don't know. If they want you to go down there and stage up, that means they probably want to Make sure that they've they've got you locked in. It's kind of like it's almost like a hard standby, right? They have like I was saying earlier, they they have standby so that they can gauge how many adjusters that they can get. <clears throat> if you go, hopefully they'll pay you they'll pay you a day rate. I think state state farm is so big, there's no reason why they, they wouldn't pay you a day rate. If they're if it's for free, then I would have question marks about it. I doubt that it's for free. Um, you can let me know in the questions here or in the, the questions, <laughs> the comments. Um, boy, there's a lot of comments. Um, so the likelihood that there you'll be sent home with no claims if you're staging in Birmingham is it exactly the same as it is if you're sitting at home right now watching the Weather Channel, which I know most of you are. <clears throat> um, if you got if you got the money to drive down there and they're going to pay you a day rate, you know it's it would if for nothing else if it, if they say oh, it was a dud, sorry, you know then you've got a State Farm certification. And maybe you've had a chance to network a little bit. You know, it's not going to be all for nothing. It's not going to be great because you're not going to get to handle any claims. But I would still look at it as an opportunity to get to know the, the IA uh, firm staff personally and maybe shake hands with one or two of the state farm managers and say, hey, you know, I'm really you know, grateful to be here. Da, 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 da. Um, hopefully we can help you guys out. Always be like, always frame everything. You know, like I'm trying, I'm here to help you close claims. I'm here to help you. Not have your phone ring. I'm here to help you, help you, right? Um, so it's who knows? It's the weather. We, it could be. Well, I just I, I don't know how to say what the chances are. And again, this is this is all induction center stuff, and sort of kind of hit that a little bit. Um, she says at the induction center, does the carrier uh, tell you what information or give you information to discuss with the claimant? How do those conversations with claimants typically go? So there's kind of two ways that claims are run, right? And this is this is a really, really great question, Jennifer. Because depending on who you deploy with, um, it, it dictates how much work you have to do on each claim, right? So I have a light on, but the sun's kind of going in that from the clouds. So it kind of makes it dark and light. So there's the two different ways are basically that when you get assigned claims, and yes, they're going to tell you exactly what to do in orientation for sure. So way number one, right? Especially if you're with State Farm or Allstate, they're gonna have you, uh, so you're, the, the, you have, the, I think with Allstate you have the option on this, but generally speaking, you're gonna wanna set your own schedule. Uh, I'm always gonna do that myself. Um, you're gonna write your claims, you're gonna map everything out, you're gonna call your insureds and introduce yourself, give you a little bit of information, set the appointment, right? And then you're going to do the inspection write the estimate, and then you're going to call, you're going to, well, you know, part of that's going to be making a policy decision based on what was damaged, um, how it was damaged, right? And then you're going to call, or if you're on site with them, face-to-face, -face, 
with the estimate, you know, say, here's the grand total for everything. Here's how, what the first check's going to be. Here's your deductible. Here's this, that, and that. that's you settling up with the cut with the homeowner, with the insured. And that's as when you do that part of it, that's extra work because you have, if you don't write them up on site, then you have to make extra phone calls or whatever. A lot of companies are that way. State Farm and Allstate are going to be that way for sure. Um, in fact, they may even have you write checks. So you have like, a, you know, they'll have you print checks and sign them and then like keep a register and all this kind of stuff. Um, the other way is that you get assigned your claims, you route them, you call them, you, and you set your schedule and you go out and you inspect the house, take all your pictures. You make, you may or may not make a coverage decision. You may just scope what the insured is saying is, is damaged. You write an estimate based on that. Um, in some cases, they're going to say, you know, you still have to make a coverage decision and say, well, I can't pay for that. But you're not going to tell the insured. So that's where that's where it stops, right? So you're just going to do those. You're going to basically scope and write the estimate, shake hands with the insurance. Thank you. That's all I have. And, uh, um, you know, Hilltop Claims, uh, you know, representative from the company will give you a call and they'll go over the grand totals with you or they'll go over uh, what the next steps are and what the coverages are and all that kind of stuff. Thanks. Bye. Right. And then you go on to the next one. Do you, that's, there's a lot of work there that you're not doing. Um, and sometimes those gigs, it's hard to say there's so many different insurance companies. There's a lot of little boutique insurance companies, really small insurance companies, and there's a lot of IA firms and they all have different things worked out. You could have any sort of variation with that. If you are talking to the insured and you have to settle up with the customer, um, typically what's going to happen especially with the big companies. I'm just going to keep using big red and big blue because most of you guys are probably going to deploy with one of them um, for the most part. So essentially what they'll do is, is that they they know that you're new. If they know that you've never handled a claim before. Um, I'm going to check something real quick. Okay. Plenty of battery. So they know that you're new. Um, they know that you've never handled claims before. So they're going to kind of have tight reins on you. They may give you the same number of claims initially that they gave me as a, you know, experienced adjuster, but they may say you have zero draft authority, right? So draft authority. Right. Or settlement authority. Is <clears throat> if you are responsible for settling with the insured depending on your experience level and how well you're doing, they will either give you zero to start, right? So zero dollars. So when you go to the insurance house, you basically have that conversation where you say, all right, thank you very much. I'm going to take this back to the office and I'm going to um, go through your coverages and um, put my report together and then I'll give you a call in a few days and or, you know, by Friday or whatever it is. And go over the next steps with you. That's all you really, all you really have to say. Here's my cell phone number. If you have any questions in the meantime, don't hesitate to give me a call, blah, blah, blah. Right. Then you go back to your hotel room or you go back to the help room. If you're new, if they have a help room with pilot, they're going to have help rooms. Everyone's going to have help rooms. Go to the help room and get help. It may be packed, probably be packed, but go there. Right. You're going to sit down and you're going to write that claim up, put your photos in, label your photos. Do the GLR, do your activity, do all, do the whole claim start to finish, and then you're going to send it up. And a file reviewer or your manager is going to look at the file and basically make sure that you, you did everything you're supposed to do. And then they'll call you or email you and say, the file looks good. Go ahead and call your insurer and settle up, right? Or they'll say, you missed this, this, and this. You know, don't forget to put debris removal, da, 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 da. Add that to your estimate. You know, redo all that stuff. And once you get that put together, then, you know, Either send it back up to me, I'll look at it again, or you know, put those things in there and then call your insured and settle up, right? So that's zero draft authority. So you cannot settle with the insured without having your the file approved first, right? You do six, 10, 12, maybe, and they probably bump you up to 5K, right? Maybe 10K somewhere in there. And if you have a claim that has $4,700 worth of damage and you can write that up on site, like it's, they've got like a thousand linear feet of fence. I mean, that's a super easy estimate to write. And it's going to be, you know, maybe it's somewhere between five and 10 or you need, it's in, within your authority. You go back inside, you write that up on your laptop and you 
uh, this is what I would do. And I turn my laptop around and say, okay, this is grand total. Here's your deductible. Here's the depreciation, blah, blah, blah. You know, <clears throat> here's your check or check will be in the mail. You get the check in, in a week to 10 business days. If you got any questions, call me, da, da, da. And you can close that claim, right? That's your draft authority. So you can settle any claim that's at that amount or less, right? And by the end of the storm, ideally, you're going to want to have 25K to probably won't get up to 50K if you're brand new. But, you know, you can sell all claims up to 25,000 bucks, right? Which is pretty cool because it saves you a ton of time. So if you're if you're really, really dil diligent in the very beginning and you've, you know, you've got Xactimate down pretty well and you, uh, you know, you got good, everything looks good in your file and your manager's like, all right, you know, you did, you did six or eight and they trust you they bump you up to, to five you know then you handle those okay but you you have to call you may have to call in like once you get to here like if they if they bump you from zero to five they may say okay if you have a seven thousand dollar claim you have to call me and tell me what you're doing in the file before you can settle up right so they may do it that way where you're like okay so the insured has you know a bunch of shingles going off the front slope um and the, the shingles are pretty brittle i, I think i can probably i think they're probably too brittle to repair you know, um, okay, well, text me a picture of that, right? They may say that. Um, and then um, what I want to do with that is I want to replace the front slope and the ridge cap and the, you know, they have water damage on the inside. So I'm going to do paint and drywall and insulation on the ceiling, da da da, da right? And uh, your manager will go, okay, well, that sounds pretty good. That sounds like it's about right in the ballpark. Go ahead, right? $7,000. You write in your, your activity diary, you know, file approved by your manager, right? For, for authorization or off, right? They call it off. Um, so that's how that works, Jennifer. If that's Michael, it's a storm hit hugs Florida coast is cat four. Would you expect enough damage up and down the coast to warrant claims? <clears throat> um, I think because the storms, it's hurricanes, and if I'm if I have this backwards, let me know. But I think because they they do this kind of like rotation right is that right if it's moving this way then basic physics is going to say that that with this forward motion and this motion going backwards that those are kind of kind of be still almost right so it's it's like if you're driving forwards in a pickup truck at 10 miles an hour and your buddy's in the back of the pickup truck and he throws a baseball straight back off the pickup truck at 10 miles an hour theoretically it'll just drop straight down right so the winds aren't going to be very high in that circumstance if i if i got that right which if it's the other way then yeah it'll be like a buzzsaw going up the coast if it makes more of a, a hit like this on the coastline yeah i mean everything up here on the northwest side of that storm is going to get smashed up and it may not be so bad down here they're going to get a lot of rain they'll get winds Storm surge, it will be everywhere, but this is kind of the, qu the quadrant of death, I think. If it hugs the coast, so long to answer your question, um, there'll be a lot of rain. There'll be, probably be a lot of storm surge, so there'll probably be a lot of flooding. Um, the winds probably won't be that high until this thing gets up to the Carolinas, right, where you, know, you got Florida down here, and then the Carolinas stick out like that. If it runs up the, co the coast and then smashes into the Carolinas right there, then yeah, this is going to be but this will probably not be somebody will be busy with it, but it's not going to be all hands on deck, like 25,000 adjusters there for that at all. And this is, again, this is a perfect example. If that happens, it's a perfect example of, um, you know, being put on standby for a ton of hurricanes and only going on a half a dozen in 20 years. All right. So if you, Angie asks, if you're called for uh, deployment, which exact mate should you get? You get the exact mate they tell you to get. And it's probably going to be 28, right? Desktop. Um, you won't be likely, unless you're doing photo assist or VA stuff or whatever, you're likely going to have this, the fastest and simplest way to do claims and the way that's going to be the most reliable for them, because this is the way they've been doing it forever, is you're going to go out and scope your loss. And you take your scope back to your laptop in the truck or your hotel room or at the help room, and you're going to write it up and exact me. And that's probably, I mean, State Farm and Allstate are going to do it that way. They're not going to be like, well, just jump in. And then maybe they will, like with limited people, 
Um, and there may be companies that, that want to do mobile, but the easiest and fastest thing and the most reliable thing is going to be this. Um, again, the number one answer to that question is whatever they tell you. If they want you to use X1, right, then use X1. If they want you to use Symbility or whatever, then use those things. But they'll tell you. And they'll probably, and either at orientation, they'll they'll have a guy or like four or five people sitting there at a, at a table and you just walk up with your laptop and set it on the table and the guy will spin it around, pop it open, give me your password, and then he'll set up Xactimate for you the way they want you to do it. He'll put all the macros in that they want you to use, all the activity diary templates, he'll put in the headers and the company, the opening statements and all that stuff. So you shouldn't have to do anything. The other thing that they may do is they may say, uh, once they deploy you, they may say, okay, well, I'm going to have you remote it, my, you know, Mario, the IT guy, will remote in with you. Just set up an appointment with him. He'll get into your computer and set it all up for you. And then you can just, and you can do that at Starbucks or McDonald's on their Wi Fi when you're on your way. So just buy it by the month, Angie. Buy it by the month. Okay. Don't, and you might, like with, with Pilot, once you're deployed, mo and most IA firms are this way, um, if you buy it, Xactimate on your own, what is it? It changes all the time, but I think right now it's like 250, right? It might be 315, last thing I, I saw. If you get deployed with Pilot, it's 89 bucks a month. Just do it month to month. When you are getting close to the end of your subscription, a message will pop up on your laptop screen and it'll say, you know, you're within seven days of your subscription expiring. Um, be sure to connect your good exec for sales to re-up it. And all I have to do is go back into pilotcat.com, get into the portal and renew through the pilot cat portal to get this, right? And I'm gonna tell you right now, I know what you're gonna ask. Somebody's asking this because I just thought it. If you get deployed with uh, ABC claims and they don't have a discount, you cannot use this. You can't do it because you have to be set up through ABC claims because this will, it's it won't, you probably could figure out a way to make it work, but don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, so in other words, what I'm saying is, is that, you know, get the pilot price if you're working for a different IA firm. Don't, don't even try it. I wouldn't try it anyway. And, you know, if you deploy it on this, you're probably making so much money anyway, it won't matter. I can go home at night. I'm that close. Well, I'll tell you what, it may be worth it to stay at a hotel so that you don't have distractions at home because you're going to be up late rating estimates. And you don't want to, oh, I got the dog out. Oh, I got you know, wife. Ah, oh, what the, oh, the wives and the kids. Or, you know, maybe that's, you know. Okay, so Stephen asked, what is next gen? So, Certain uh, carriers have uh, proprietary, in a lot of cases, um, what they call claims management systems, right? So NextGen is one of those things, right? And it's all this is an all-state thing, right? So NextGen is like when you want to do an activity diary, when you want to set reserves on a claim, when you want to write checks, when you anything that you got to do in the claim, this, you have to go into NextGen to do it, right? So they like to keep everything. They don't want to have exact analysis be a part of it or, or a big part of it. They want to have everything controlled. Because this is what they use, like their staff adjusters use this, right? State Farm has ECS, right? Um, Liberty Mutual has Navigator. Um, they used, I don't know, if, I don't think they're using CBO anymore. Um, so there's companies that use, some of the IA firms are going to use VCA, right? So there's there's a whole bunch of them. These are part. These are things that you're going to get to learn how to use in more detail when you go to orientation, right? So, and I'm going to tell you right now, if you're sitting there, and I, I watch guys do this on Katrina. You're sitting there in your next gen class, right? And you got you have to know how to use this to run claims. If you don't, you're going to be you will be absolutely screwed. You'll be sitting there in the help room, scratching your head, trying to figure out how to. You have to stay in all the class. My point is, stay in all the classes, right? Guy was sitting next to me. And he has laptop open, his phone rang, and or he got he had a message or an email or something, and it said it, he had claims, right? He like freaked out, closed his laptop, threw it in the bag, put it over his shoulder. He's like, I got claims, and he ran out of the room, right? And it, we were one hour into an eight-hour course on next gen. He didn't he had never been on a storm before, he had no idea what he was doing, and he walked out of this training, which any of these trainings, you have to know how to use these in order to run claims, and they are not. They're not intuitive, right? They're not user friendly. They're, they, these things are designed by software developers to check off uh, 
basically the carrier says, we need the software to do these 50 things. The software developer who's never handled a claim before in their life, they don't do claims, says, okay, we can build you something that does all those 50 things. It does those 50 things, but not in any kind of an order that makes sense to a, a regular human being, right? So you have to stay for all this training, right? It's so critical, so important. Average day rate. So usually it's 700 bucks and you're going to split that 60-40. Uh, so you'll get 450. Typically like with pilot, if you, on day rate with pilot, pretty much no matter what you do, you can expect to, before taxes and expenses, get 450, right? Still there? Oh, gee, I can't even read that. So anyway, yeah, so you'll walk away with 450. That's what day rate is. And it's, I mean, you're not going to get rich on it, but uh, Sabina and Ryan, 100%. Um, there was like boats, like in cars and things all like tangled up with people's clothes and like their furniture and bedding, like all piled up and wrapped around trees in the, like at the outside of the Home Depot parking lot on Katrina, the whole, and down, if this was in Waveland, Mississippi, I didn't even go into New Orleans. I was in Mississippi the whole time. The whole front of the Home Depot was caved in. You could see all the way out through the back of the store and everything was all like, I mean, it's it's like a nuclear bomb went off. I don't know if I'd live near the, the coast just for that reason, because it's 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 pretty bad. Yeah, Nicole, um, I, would, I would agree with that on hotels. Don't be booking hotels until you know where you're going. And assume that you may not be staying there because they may have you stage up here, you know, in Panama City, and then your claims are all going to be nine hours away, right? So you may be in Panama City for three days, and then they may send you over there. And then you may get 15 claims in Savannah or whatever, and then all of a sudden they're going to be like, well, we know it really needs you to go to Fort Lauderdale, and then you're going to be wrap those claims up. And go, I mean, it's, you don't know, right? So it can be kind of chaotic like that. A hailstorm? right? And dailies, like a hailstorm hits this neighborhood in Denver. That's where you're working. And if you'd be there all summer long, right? I was talking to somebody earlier who's been on a deployment, a hail deployment in Minneapolis for four and a half months. And she's now wrapping it up. Perfect timing. I mean, he's like, I, you know, they, I'm cut off and it's like, I'm, I'm ready to be released and go home. Go, I was just going to go home, but now I'm going to go to a hurricane. It's hurricanes for, for a working catastrophe adjuster, a person who, like, again, like I said, I've done six, six of these things, in the last 20 years, I've made 95% of my money on hailstorms, right? So when you guys get experience and when you become, you know, this is this, if this thing is a thing and this will launch your career, right? You've got to hold on to this thing and just claw through it and just seven days a week, just to count on not getting any sleep, a few hours max, right? And just baby steps, just, just move through it. And before you know it, You'll be doing six a day at the end of the storm. Your manager is going to be like, dude, you're doing a great job. Would you like to stay and do cleanup? You know, that'll last through next March or it could last 12 months, right? You'd have no idea. So if the storm's big, there are people, there were people like, I'm sorry, I ran a little bit, but like on Hurricane Andrew, people were there for several years, right? The Northridge earthquakes, there were people that were working in Northridge for 12 years, working claims there. They made they bought houses in Los Angeles. That's how good they were doing. And it's expensive real estate. So managing finances. I think somebody else was asking me that this too. So during a deployment, you're going to have a lot of expenses, right? So your primary expenses are going to be hotel and fuel, right? You have to eat no matter where you are. So it's sort of a wash. You're going to be eating out a lot more. I shouldn't say it's a wash because you're going to probably be eating out a lot more. You're going to be eating a lot of, you know, 99 cent dinners if they even do that anymore, um, from drive throughs right? You're going to be eating a lot of cheese. You, I mean, you can find healthy options, um, but the fastest thing is going to be, it's going to be the fast food, right? And if you're like in a hurry and you're starving and you have, you, it's 4.30 in the afternoon and you just realize that you didn't eat breakfast or lunch and you're starving and you've got, you know, another appointment, you can either wait till after you finish that appointment or you can grab a taco, right? And just like kind of top yourself off a little bit. Um, so finances, I would say it's important if, you know, if I would, if, if this, if this was like, let's say this was January, and we're having this conversation, I would tell you that I would want personally to have at the minimum, absolute minimum, $3,000 in cash, right? Or a credit card. I'm not a credit card person, but you know, it may be in a pinch, it would work. 
credit card with a high limit, like an American Express or something like that. Um, I'd want you to have resources available to you so that you can just walk into the hotel, here's the money, you know, take the key, go do your thing, fill up the truck without having to like, you know, be okay, well, I can put $7 worth in right now. You know, you don't want to be in that situation. Um, in certain circumstances, if you are um, not financial, financially prepared, um, if you don't have a good credit card or something that you can, I mean, again, last resort, I'm, like I said, I'm not like, I don't like credit stuff. I live in a paid for motorhome. So um, some IA firms, and you have to ask them specifically, you have to say, you know, listen, this is my situation. I really want to help out I'm taking these courses. Da, da, da. I ran out of money with all this training and all the stuff I had to do. Um, but I really want to help you guys on this storm. Is there any way I can get an advance on a paycheck? Right. And they'll say, Either yes, let's you know, let's talk about it a little bit more. Let's say we don't do that. Um, you're going to get day rates. You know, when you, hopefully when you show up, if you're having to sit through orientations and, and be staged for a few days before the claims start to come in. <clears throat> but I think more than anything, don't spend. I mean, you're going to when you start turning claims in, take it from somebody who started doing this in his late 20s. Um, the first like $7,500 paycheck you get, or the $13,000 paycheck you get. I mean, you're like, dudes, we're going to Morton's. We're going to go and I'm going to buy everybody a filet and we're going to get a $600 bottle of wine. Just don't do that. Just you don't have to do that. You can go have a nice dinner. You can let off steam all you want to, but protect that money, right? Because when this hurricane's over, then literally, like if there weren't any hurricanes, like if there wasn't a hurricane season right now, storm season for like the hail and everything else is pretty much over, right? There can still be some storms. We still get a winter storm. Um, but in, in my career, this, this time of year has been like traditionally, um, I'm still working hail probably through the middle of October, maybe into the, like a little bit past Halloween. I'm usually not working on Thanksgiving. Um, I know that that time I'm not doing anything again until probably March or April. Right. So I'm off the rest of that time. Um, the, either you work during that time, you have like a job that you can get really easily and quit really easily to protect the money that you're going to earn on this hurricane or you live off the money from the hurricane. Um, I would say that th the financial management probably comes more into play after you leave the storm with a big bulging pocket full of cash. Um, you want to protect that money. Um, don't be for, for several years when I first got started, I would be, I didn't want to work when I didn't have to work. So I didn't do work like after hurricane or storm season was over. I went and visited friends. I went to the, you know, went and traveled, you know, Europe and Central America. And, and by the time April, mid, late April, like tax time, you know, I'm like, oh, here's, I have to pay a couple of, you know, checks on taxes because you, you know, you got a lot of states with taxes. Um, I'm almost out of money. And then phone rings and I'm back in it and I'm like happy again, right? So things start to get kind of skinny there towards the end. You guys are all adults, you know, you, you should know how to manage money in general. When you're talking about um, this kind of income where it's super variable, like you make a great big chunk of money in a short period of time and then you don't make anything. I'm going to tell you from my experience, that big pile, I consider that a windfall and have something else that you do that, that covers the bills the rest of the year. Daily claims is a great thing to do. Um, you can come and go from daily for most IA firms. Um, they'll be cool about it. Um, you know, you can, there's all kinds, I mean, literally sky's the limit. Anything you can think of, you can do. Listen, Michael, if they need you, if they tell you to be someplace in 48 hours, you got to do it. My very first storm, I drove from Los Angeles to Chicago straight through in 31 hours. 35 hours. I slept in my car. It was not fun. It was not cool. And I, I pulled into Chicago and went straight into the storm office. Um, it's, it's kind of the nature of the beast. So, um, okay. So husband and wife teams, <clears throat> anytime you're working with somebody, whether it's your spouse or it's a assistant or it's a buddy or whatever, what you're trying, what you're trying to accomplish is you're trying to uh, increase your productivity by a certain percentage. Right. And, Unless you're both doing claims and you're both really, really good and fast at doing the whole claims process, everything start to finish, you're probably not going to double your money, right? So it's not like that kind of a multi multiplier. You can, if if you can do by yourself, if you can do five claims a day, but if you have a, a partner or a teammate and you can do seven claims a day, 
that's a significant increase in productivity. That's a, that's a lot more money. Two more claims a day is significant, right? And the way it works, this is what I tell people, is that you have one person who's the face of the claim, right? And you may both need to be uh, licensed um, for this to work out. It just depends on the carrier. Um, sometimes some of them kind of get squirrely about it. Other ones don't care. Um, <clears throat> so you're going to, I, I, this is how I, I do it and how I would suggest doing it, I think, the easiest way. Um, the things that when you're handling claims by yourself, the number one thing, well, that slows me down is this thing, right? It's the phone and email and text. Any communications that come in, you can't let them just slide, right? So if you're out hot and heavy, you know, high speed claims handling um, and the phone's ringing and that's like, you know, kind of like screwing up your whole process of why well, I got to do this phone thing and you just push them off or I'll do them tomorrow in the morning before lunchtime or, you know, whatever. You can't do that. So I tell people, if you're going to be on a team, if you're going to have an assistant, outsource your desk, right? And by your desk, I mean all your admin stuff, your like basic contacts, right? So you have somebody, they may stay back at the hotel room. They're going to get into your voicemail. They're going to get into your email, right? And they're going to stay on top of that stuff for you. If you are, you may be able to have like somebody just make the basic contact for you and say, and set your, your schedule, right? Maybe you, you put all your routing together, you build out your schedule and you hand it to your spouse and then you go out the door for the day with your seven claims because you don't have to spend an extra two or three hours on the phone by yourself because that's what you have to do when you're, when you're on your own. Your assistant back at, the, at your hotel room or wherever they are, they're going to make all your, your contacts and, and build your schedule or, and, and set all your appointments, and your inspection appointments, right? So uh, the voicemails that come in typically with, especially early in the storm, are going to be from people that are calling you back because you left them a message, right? So you're playing phone tag a lot. So those people might call back and say, hey, 2 o'clock on Thursday is great. I'll see you then, right? If I am by myself and I have to sit there with my piece of paper and my pen and my earbud in and listen to a bunch of voicemails, right? So I had to write, you know, 3 p.m., uh, Mrs. So-and-so called, da, da da good to go, right? So I'm doing that work. I'm writing that out, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in the activity diary, right? So I have to go back and have to go to Xactimate or Exact Analysis or Next Gen or ECS or whatever it is, and I got to put that information in. No matter what, anytime you talk to somebody or try to contact somebody, you have to, you have to make a note of it, right? And we can talk about that too. Um, so if I have to do that, that's a lot of extra work. It takes time, right? It might take me, you know, 12 seconds or 27 seconds to listen to that voicemail, but then I have to either call that person back to confirm if they confirm, which sometimes happens. They'll say, you know, two o'clock on Thursday is fine. Just call me back to confirm to let me know that that's, that's still good to go. And you, and you call them. Don't be like, well, you know, I said it was, and I'm not going to call them. Call them back, right? Somebody wants you to call them back, call them back. Um, if you have somebody in the hotel room who is, they can be in their pajamas if they want to be. They can, you know, they can have uh, the Oprah show on or be watching Ellen or whatever, um, whatever else comes on TV during the day. Um, they're not going to be bored. They're not going to be sitting around going, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I, maybe I'll go to the park today. They're, the phone's going to be ringing, right? They're going to have to be checking your voicemail um, all the time. Or if, if, the, if the calls come in, uh, or, you know, calls or emails or whatever, they have to, like, stay on top of that for you. That thing right there, and then having to put that those those things into Xactimate, right, in your diary, that is a huge deal, right? People think, this is the thing that I see people do that I, I, I disagree with, because the phone call stuff does never goes away, no matter what. I don't care what kind of technology they have. You got to use a phone for this job a lot. Um, if you have two people, you know, he or she's in the truck and the spouse is up on the roof, right? He's got a radio headset on and he's like Wi-Fi pictures back to, you know, texting pictures back to her and she's writing the estimate. You can be fast that way. And I know people that have made that work. The person in the car has got to know what they're doing. They've got to know how to, they have to be an adjuster, right? They, they both have to have the same skills. Um, so, the phone still rings, right? So if it's in my pocket, I'm up on the roof, it's going to voicemail, right? So then somebody's got to 
somebody's got to get on the phone and call those people back or, or make the list. You know, if you get 27 email or 27 voicemails, you still have to write them all out and, you know, go down the list. I check the way I, only way I know how to do this, because you're going to have to put that information in the exact to me. If you just listen to them and then hit call back. Yeah, it sounds good. And then go to the next one, call back. Yeah, it sounds good. You know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You don't have any record of what you just did. You have to write it down. Said, okay, oh, can't do that time, wants to do this time, write it out. It's got to go into your diary, right? Has to go into the diary. Um, so long, long, long story short, for teams, the best, I, I personally, for me, the very best thing is going to be having somebody take care of that phone stuff, making sure that all of my diaries are up to date and any sort of like fires that need to be put out, running errands you know maybe like uh ordering in groceries or maybe you rent a car or you brought a second car doing laundry you, you gotta have clean clothes you know mr mom can stay back at the hotel and do laundry and be you know on the voicemails and doing things at the same time um that stuff still has to happen right you can't just i mean you could you could take 60 days worth of underwear but you're gonna have a gigantic duffel bag full of underwear right if you want to have if you don't ever want to do laundry so for i now have four hundred and sixty thousand miles on my uh forerunner I have driven back and forth across this country. I can't tell you how many times. So Andrew asks, this is a good question. Switching gears just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but uh, what are your thoughts on the best networking strategies and where sh should we look for opportunities when training isn't in session? So conferences, right? Um, you're going to have in-person certification stuff. I know Pilot is doing training year round, right? And they'll have like if you want to get State Farm certified in January or AMFAM certified, if you've got some experience, um, you may have to go to Dallas or Mobile. Go to those places. Meet the people that are sitting at the tables around you. Meet the instructors. Exchange phone numbers. Get to know those people because no matter where you are and no matter who's sitting next to you, your peers, I think this is probably at least as important as anything else. You make friends with those guys <clears throat> and gals and Four months from now, in March or in uh, you know, in say May or whatever, your phone's been you've been calling all your IA firms and they're like, no, nope, we don't have anything, we don't have anything. All of a sudden, you get a text message because you've been keeping up with these people that you you met at this course or this you know certificate, whatever it is, orientation. They do those orientations. Um, they shoot you a text message or they call and say, hey, what's going on? Oh yeah, listen, I just got called to go um, on this this little hailstorm in uh, wherever, right? And uh, they say they need a couple more people and ask me if I knew, knew anybody. Well, that's you, isn't it? So you pick up the phone and you call that firm and you say, hey, uh, I just got a hot tip. You know, it sounds like you guys may need an extra person on this particular cap. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Are you on our, on our roster? Yeah, I am. All right, well, you know, get your stuff together and get your butt to Omaha or wherever it is, right? So you can get deployment opportunities by knowing other people who can get deployment opportunities because some people are going to get called before other ones just by, the, it's like, you know, it's almost like roulette a little bit. Um, so... I would absolutely network whenever possible, make friends with people on storms. Um, sometimes they'll, like if you've been on a storm for a long time, the people who are left, the management may say, we're gonna have a pizza party and just, you know, thank you guys for being here or whatever. Go to those, don't like skip those cause you're like, eh, I don't wanna do it. I wanna just, you know, go to bed early, whatever. Go to those, make friends with people. Um, cause you never know. You never know who is gonna be somebody that's, that you can, you can help later on or they can help you later on. So this is it's networking one-on-one, -on -one, right? Conferences, NACA, it's huge, it's massive, right? It's it's a little bit expensive, <clears throat> but there's at least 60 IA firms that are at NACA. Recruiters, um, directors of HR are there, operations managers. These people are, and they will. You have an app and for the conference that says you can set up interviews with whoever you want to, and they've got the, everybody's schedule on there. I want to interview with Pilot. At 10 o'clock, I want to interview with Vanguard at 10:15, and you have 15-minute windows. I want to interview with Crawford at 10:45. I want, and you just, and you could just all day long. You've got like a big, great big stack of resumes, and you go and you shake hands with those people, talk about your experience really quick, and then go to the next one. Thank you so much. Right? It's it's a big deal, and it's worth the price of admission times 10. Paysetter has a conference. Mid America Cat has a conference. I mean, a lot of the IA firms have conferences. IAS. Um, whole bunch of them, whole bunch of them, but I have never been, and it, it, I could have just missed it. I've never been to an IA firm's, uh, conference where they allowed me to sit down and interview with 
somebody from HR, but you sat down with them. This, you know, you could have a meeting with them for 15 minutes or whatever, hand them your resume and talk about your resume talk about your, you know, what you want to do and getting on whatever. I've never been to an IA firm conference where they did that. They have a ton of CE stuff. They might do like a, you know, you might have a two hour long California earthquake thing. Um, but NACA is, if, if you can't go to any other, all but one, only one, go to NACA for sure, 100%. It'd be worth it. It'd be absolutely worth it. Yeah, Barbie. So whoever just doing the inspection needs to be licensed. Some companies uh, will say that whoever's, if anybody makes phone calls, uh, also needs to be licensed. So dedicated Wi-Fi hotspot. I don't have one. I'm actually using my phone right now as a Wi-Fi hotspot. Works great. It's actually got a broadband signal, which is really super awesome. Um, typically, Andrew, what I'm going to do for... Uh, I don't like to work when I go back to the hotel room. That's I, I, I try to close everything on site. So typically what I will do is either go to like Starbucks or Panera like during the day and get caught up on some computer work, spend it 45 minutes or 30 minutes or maybe an hour or whatever. Make some, if I get new claims come in, I'll schedule them out while I'm sitting there and make those phone calls, input those into Xactimate, hit upload on, on McDonald's' Wi-Fi and go on about my business. When I get back to my hotel room, truly, I don't, I don't want to pull my computer out of the bag doing this a long time i've got a system right to where i can do that um but most hotels are going to have pretty good wi-fi or good enough wi-fi to upload claims right and to do like basic web surfing stuff most hotels on hurricanes if the infrastructure is down um it may be a problem i know that that companies like verizon and these other companies are going to have temporary towers and stuff so they'll put they'll make sure they can get communications back in um so if you've got you know, a good plan with like, like I have Verizon. I, I love them. I, I've tried everybody and Verizon has been the best for me. Um, but I just use my phone's hotspot. So I don't have a dedicated extra line for it. So I never use it the rest of the year. Right. So I don't want to pay for something I don't use all the time. Jennifer, work for IFRM doing daily claims, with the ability to work for other firms. I don't do ladders. Is it better to find a desk adjuster work with cat firm, cat firm for this storm or is ladder assist readily available? So you can't have ladder assist on every single claim. You either have to pay them. Um, and if you, you can't like if, if companies that provide ladder assist, like Allstate, they're not going to send ladder assist on one stories. But if you, if you have an issue or, or you know, a perfectly, believe me, it's perfectly legitimate fear of heights and falling off and injuring yourself. No one can blame you. That's, you know, I question my sanity sometimes when I think about some of the roofs I've climbed. If it's a one-story roof, you you have to you'll have to pay for a ladder assist yourself, and you can't because you have to coordinate two two schedules, along with coordinating schedule with the insured and maybe even a contractor. So you, you add in another person, it, it increases your opportunities for chaos and for things to break. Right. So I would say no. If you don't want to climb ladders, then I would say there's going to be a ton of desk opportunities, um, and you should in the, your deployment notifications from people that you've got signed up with. They probably a lot of them have probably said, do you want to work field, you know, residential? Do you want to work uh, auto? Do you want to work inside? Do you want to do file review? That you know, they'll give you a whole list of things and you get W for this and one for that, whatever it is. Um, if you don't want to do ladder, if you don't want to climb roofs, don't don't even I would I would recommend not getting involved with the field side of it because you'll have to get on every roof and it'll be either prohibitively expensive for you to pay 40 or 50 or 60 bucks every single time. And it'll screw up your schedule. You won't get anything done because you'll have to coordinate with so many other people. I, I wouldn't do it. You can make great money doing desk stuff, um, doing file review, doing anything rem like remote things, and they're going to need that stuff. Um, going into the office, like if you if they want you to go to Mobile or, or Dallas or whatever, and go sit in the cube farm and you know be on the phone and do VA stuff like write estimates from the photos that you get from the VAs. Do it. It's it's going to be good money. 450 a day is not chump change, especially if you're going to be on a, a much longer term assignment than probably a lot of the field people in one of those offices. 450 a day adds up. It's like eight grand a month. I mean, it's not, it's not the kind of money that the field people are going to make in that short span of time, but you'll be at it longer and it'd be much, much more reliable. You know what your paycheck is going to be every month. So day rate is uh, nothing to be ashamed of. That's for sure. Dave, real quick, uh, how did taxes work? You have to pay uh, state tax in a state where you, if you if you earn income, if you're in that state earning income, you have to pay tax. You have to file 
in that state. I've had to file like nine states in the past. Um, it's a kind of a pain in the butt, but you got to do it. If you don't, big trouble. You don't want to get in trouble with the, the, the tax people. Steve asks, how the manager should feel about you uh, ordering an online roof sketch for a complex and or dangerous roof? Dude, If you, listen, you can buy all the roof sketches you want to. I don't care who you work for. If you pull up to a house and you're like, holy smokes, and it's like, you know, spires and pirouettes, and it looks like a Disney palace or whatever, jump on Eagle View. I mean, you should have reconned that beforehand and, and seen that like when you were setting your claims up and when you're doing your routing. Um, I would have ordered the Eagle View then and, and just had it loaded and ready to go. Um, 100%, nobody wants you to fall off a roof at all. If you, if you don't feel comfortable climbing a roof, even if it's a one story, but it's really steep, and it doesn't look like there's any safe way to do it, and you don't have the gear to do it yourself, like open harness or whatever, um, and you're not authorized to use a drone, um, order Eagle View. Get ladder assist. You know, you, you may have to reschedule that claim if you didn't, if you didn't, if you couldn't tell from the, the like the satellite view or whatever that it was going to be gnarly and dangerous. Um, no one in this industry will ever fault you for choosing safety over the the potential higher potential risk of falling off a roof and breaking something yourself. Um, so don't don't ever hesitate. If you if you if you're looking on the uh, pull up to a house or if you're looking at satellite imagery and you see that it looks like it's going to be um, there's no way it'll, it'll take you three, even if it's easy to walk on it, it'll take you three hours to, to diagram it. Just order Eagle View. It's a rich top, a little bit cheaper, rich top. Uh, I think they're richtoptech.com now. You can go to richtopsketch.com and it should forward you to rich top tech, but they're like $35 a piece. I think the last time I looked at it. So, uh, Andrew, if you've got a 40 foot ladder and you tell, tell your manager, you like, listen, I can get on a three story building. I've got a, the 40 foot ladder. Um, they'll give you those claims for sure and they may even they may even ask you they may say hey listen if we've if you, there's another adjuster that you know needs help get on a roof would you be willing to do it you know if they gave you 20 bucks or 50 whatever it was be able to help them get on that roof and you can work things out when you go to orientation you know if you want to help people out that's that's entirely up to you but absolutely tell them that you've got um goat and a 40 foot ladder I, i've done ladder assist before and I had a 40 foot ladder on my forerunner and it looked hilarious, but I mean, it worked. I was in New Jersey too. If Dorian ends up being mostly a flood event, any chance the firms, yeah, absolutely. Um, if they have more flood claims, um, then they have flood adjusters. They're going to be, they'll be asking like, like that happened um, on that, on Sandy when that guy walked in and he was like, he just basically rounded up 15 people and took them all over to a, a like a, super fast like you know crash course flood emergency flood thing and send them out the door with it right um so absolutely can do flood i had i've had two accountants and both of them were not any good i mean they they were they didn't know the business and i didn't know how to find one this was years ago i've been doing my own taxes for a long time um but because i i know how to do my own taxes i know what i can deduct and what i can't deduct um, I, I've also worked with Pilot for a long time, and Pilot was all W-2, so they took taxes out. So there was only limited things that I could deduct anyway. So my taxes were relatively easy. And they used TurboTax, and it would import things to, you know, if I had nine states, it would carry stuff over into each one, and I would just send them all off. I might have to send $40 to Colorado. I get $312 back from Indiana. You know, I may have to pay $1,200 to Kansas. You know, it's, it, you have to do that kind of thing, but... It's uh, if you can find an accountant and if, if there's anybody who's a CPA or knows a CPA that knows this business, let me know. And I'll, I'll, I could probably get you a lot of work. Just, just saying. Hey, if you like what you're seeing so far, I'd love it if you'd hit that like button. All right, back to it. Uh, I see people living in a sedan. Depends on what you can stand. Just get a hotel. I mean, I'm telling you, sleeping in the bed, getting a hot shower at the end of the day. It's, it is, you've got a mental thing going on here right it's not all about like saving 89 extra dollars a night right that that money goes into your personal well-being your, your stress level your anxiety level if you're sleeping in your car and you're having to move block to block because you don't want to you know I, sleep in a bed just just sleep in a bed it's it's an expense um depending on who you work for and how you work 
it can be deductible off your taxes, right? You're not, I don't think that, I see a lot of people um, try to find ways to uh, save money. Like they'll have, they'll, they'll drive a beater to the storm site. Like I, when I was doing Sandy, I was a, a field support when I was training people. Um, I would go meet adjusters at their houses and just follow them around and like help them with stuff. And like, you know, I would help them with big losses. I would help show them how to do things. And there was one guy I went out with um, on a few claims and he, every single claim, like we pull up to the house, we do the, the, the whatever. And then he would go and open up the hood of his, his little SUV and start wrenching around in there for like five minutes. And then like his wife was in, you know, in the driver's seat and okay, try it now. He did that on every single one. And like, finally it would start, close the lid. All right, we'll see you on the next one. I'm like, what? why don't you take this thing in the shop? Oh, I'm a good mechanic. You know, it just takes a little wiring. Da -da -da. I'm saving some money. Take your, I would literally like take your car to the dealership. I know people hate the dealership, but they're going to have all the parts. They're going to have all the diagnostics over. That's been my experience. I've, cars are a whole different thing, right? So take it somewhere and, and say, find everything that's wrong with this and give me an estimate, right? And if you can afford to pay for all those things, then do it, right? That car sitting right out there has 460,000 miles on it because I kept up with all of the scheduled maintenance. You use a timing belt, do it. If the guy says, well, we need to flush out the power steering, do it, right? Just do everything that they asked me to do, I just did it. Drive like a grandma. And I mean, that car right there has sat for six months or, or through a long, hot summer day, not only driving around from house to house, getting starter turned off, starter turned off like eight, nine, 10 times a day, at least. It sits there in idles while I'm writing the estimate. The air, air conditioner's on full blast. It's 101 degrees. It's a 105 heat index. It's 98% humidity, right? All summer long for years, years and years, since 2007, right? Um, Take care of your vehicle, take it in for all the, the, the maintenance that you can do, and it will take care of you, right? It's an expense. And that mileage, right? So people, somebody doesn't want to drive from California to Florida. I mean, I could see I could see that, but you you get 57, 58 cents a mile, right? And that's that's there and back. That's a that's a huge chunk of change that's going to come off the top of your taxes. So think about that. Mileage is probably the number one thing that you can that I've deducted off my taxes and it's been like thousands of dollars, right? Um, so I had, there was another thing here. Okay, manual scheduling, right? So Andrew was asking, the reason why I say that I want you to do your own routing, um, do your own uh, claims recon, because you're gonna have to do claims re recon anyway to see where stuff's at. Uh, make your contact calls and do your activity diary and all that stuff is because <clears throat> You need you if if the service isn't available like for schedule it for example if the, if the service isn't available to you somehow or you don't have a connection only have is like a landline because that happens sometimes that Wi-Fi is down right but you got to make all these phone calls before the you know before nine o'clock and it's too far to driving to town to go to McDonald's to get on their Wi-Fi um, you need to know how to do all of these things uh, so that you can as a backup right number one number two so that you know how to set up schedule it right. So that you're able to, you, you can say when you're when you're putting your routing preferences in, it can, it'll give you like everything that you need to do, like um, for however you want to run your claims, how much time you want to have between each claim, how long you plan on spending on on site at each one. And if you don't know those things by having run claims before, you put stuff in and your schedule is going to be screwed. You'll be like, you know, you'll have set up three appointments by one o'clock, and you know. And be start be burning up appointments because you did it because you ran out of time, right? Um, so I'm I'm gonna want you to do it manually first so that you know how everything works, right? So if you were a business owner, if you were starting a bakery, you gotta know how to bake, right? I would just hire a bunch of bakers and then um, or maybe you would. Um, the other the final thing is is that if you have an assistant or like your spouse or whatever, and you're gonna have them do that for you, you need to be able to show them how to do it, right? So this is how I do it. This is follow these steps exactly. And you know, then you get these results. If you find a better way to do this, let me know, and we'll we'll do that, right? But this is how I found this is the best way, to, the fastest way to do it, and the way that's the most efficient, right? So, and then, you know, once you do that, then turn it over to schedule it, then turn it over to your assistant. Um, that's that's my like so, sort of like, if time and money are no object, kind of a way to do it. In a pinch like this, on this big hurricane. It may be that all bets are off. You might say, you might say, you know what, for the first week, and if you, any of you guys have read my book, I know some of you guys have, 
first week, the first three days in the field, you're going to do one claim a day, right? So setting up schedule to do that super easy. You know, you're going to take a, a, an office day and then the next three days, you might do two claims a day, right? One in the morning, one in the afternoon. Um, so you can set up schedule it with that kind of schedule, but no problem at all. And with this, the new payment plan that they've got, I mean, I'm almost tempted to like totally retract my whole thing about like doing it manually first because 40 bucks a month, um, or even if you, if you pay month to month, it's 60 bucks a month. It's still a bargain. I mean, it's, it's, it's like two Eagle views, right. And it's unlimited contacts and it, it'll do everything for you. When you, the, the other thing I didn't know is that when you get to the house, you, you have a, a phone app and a desktop app, right? So you, you set everything up in the desktop app and then you jump on your phone app and you go into the field and it tells you what's next, right? When, you, when you're done at the house, you hit a button and it'll inspection completed. It sends a note to exact analysis or to exact to me, whatever, to any claims management system, any, any of them, right? And says done, right? And your manager, when you check those boxes off in Xactimate, which normally you would do without something I could schedule it, um, your manager can look in there and see, you know, he, Matt's contacted this one, but he forgot to upload the activity diary. Shoots me a note, Matt, to upload your activity diary for Mr. Johnson, right? Or this one doesn't look like it's been inspected yet. Did you go out and look at that one? Oh, yeah, I went and looked at that one two days. Two days ago, I just haven't written it up yet, right? Well, your metrics, like how you're, like how they kind of like, under normal circumstances, how they rate you is how fast you can go from contacting to inspecting to closing the claim, right? So if you don't, if you if you inspect on Monday, this is where this kind of comes into play. If you have the schedule it app, you inspect on Monday, you hit you, that you inspected it, and you're not going to write that estimate until Wednesday. You stop the clock right there, right? That that's on your inspected metric, you're good to go. If you just get your photos and your scope sheet or whatever, and you finish your scope and you go to the next one, and then you're like, well, I'm going to stick this in the back of my file. I'm going to do it on Wednesday you're not going to check that inspected box until Wednesday, right? So now you've got to added two days to your, your inspected metric. And that's, I mean, you might be cool with that, but it's in the long run, those things, those, those metrics add up and they, they use those, like I said, to rate you. Now, okay, so real quick note about hotels, because this is a little bit more relevant to um, deployments. So <clears throat> let me see if I can find this thing. Accommodations Consultants, LLC.com. Um, there's some stuff, there's a, I posted up some stuff on Facebook about this. Anyway, sh this lady will, for no charge to you, will set you up with a hotel. She'll try to negotiate a discount for you and, um, make the reservation and everything. Um, it's a pretty good way to go. And if you guys, when, you know, when, if, hopefully when, um, you get sent to wherever, jump on here and call her. Um, so. As far as negotiating with hotels, generally speaking, um, most hotels that have like, well, I think all hotels that have a kitchenette are going to have a weekly rate and a monthly rate, right? They'll have a nightly rate, just like a regular hotel. Um, but Staybridge is one of my favorite hotels to stay at. Uh, any like Hilton group, no, I'm sorry, not Hilton, the Inter Intercontinental, the IHC group. Um, so the Intercontinental ones are Holiday Inn Express. Um, they don't have uh, kitchenettes, but I, you know, if I'm traveling across the country, I'll get points. I'll stay at those, right? So Candlewood is what is an IHC property. They have they're cheaper than Staybridge, but they're pretty nice, and they have full kitchen, right? Uh, Extended Stay America has full kitchens, and they're gonna have a nightly, a weekly, and a monthly rate. Um, there's Value Place, which is super cheap and kind of. They don't have any housekeeping or anything. It's like bare bones, but they've got a kitchen, right? So it's a lot cheaper. And it's, they have, they're, I think they're only, well, I'm sure they have a nightly rate, but it's, it's mainly like weekly and monthly rates. If you go into a hotel and the only hotel you can get is the Red Roof Inn and they have a microwave and a little, you know, like college dorm fridge and that they don't have a kitchen, um, they're probably, they're not going to advertise that they have an, a weekly rate. But if you go and you talk to their sales manager, if they have a sales manager on site or their, man, their general manager or whoever they could talk to and say, listen, I'm probably going to be here for, you know, at least 30 days. Um, do you guys have, has, can, can I get your, you know, what, what rate do you have for, you know, long-term stays like that? And typically, you know, if normally they're $125 a night, 
<clears throat> you might be able to get them for 57, right? Over the long term, you're going to pay, you know, every, they probably charge you every week for that. Um, but if that's the only place you can stay, you absolutely 100% can negotiate long-term rates because you're guaranteed in that room, right? That room is guaranteed to make them some money. They've got, you know, X percent, whatever it is, uh, vacancy rate under normal circumstances. Um, most places will have uh, a monthly or, or weekly rate that you can get into. So RVs um, on a hurricane, like a typical cat scenario, it, like a, uh, a hailstorm, like you get a hailstorm in Denver, you're going to find RV campgrounds around Denver, right? And if they're probably like Jellystone, which is on the south side of Denver, is a nice place, but it's like 900 bucks a month in the summer. And it's kind of expensive for RV campground. Um, on a hurricane, uh, I've stayed on Ivan, I stayed in Mobile, and on Katrina, I also stayed in Mobile, and I found places for 200 and some bucks. Was, this course was, geez, that was like 15 years ago. 250 bucks a month, <clears throat> which you can still find places like that today for full hookups. My claims were like, Ivan, they were right there, but on Katrina, I had a two-hour one-way drive, right? The bridge, that whole big bridge, I can't remember the name of it, that goes when you, when you go west out of, on I think it's 10 out of there, that great big long, like two bridges, half that thing was gone. So it was like, you know, and the love bugs and everything. I don't know, hurricanes are kind of miserable experience. They can be miserable experiences. They're great money though. Um, so wherever you can, I would say this, be prepared, no matter, whether you're in a hotel or you're in an RV, be prepared for, to drive, to be sitting in your car a lot, right? And that's another reason why having an assistant who can do the phone stuff for you is great because you're not checking your voicemail when you go down the interstate. I wouldn't, I mean, maybe if your assistant's sitting there, right, you can do it. Um, but don't be like, well, I gotta be within 30 minutes of my claim. You're not, you'd be lucky if you can get within 20 or 30 minutes of your claims. Chances are you'll probably be more like, 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes plus, um, just depending on what the, the situation is. The campgrounds might be gone. I mean, they, you know, there's it's basically a parking lot, the RV campgrounds. Um, but if the, all the infrastructure is gone, all the trees are down all over everything, they have to clean that all up before they can let anybody in. So you probably, no matter what, you're going to be staying outside of, of the damaged zone, right? And depending on where your claims are, um, you could be driving. So just be prepared for that. That opens up your options because there's going to be, you're going to find a whole lot more out stuff outside. A lot of campgrounds are outside of city areas. Um, it's hard to find a campground inside of city limits in a lot of places, um, which is weird. I found in Los Angeles, I had to stay, I had claims in LA for mudslide years ago and I had to stay in Valencia, which is over the hill. Um, it was, it's up by, Six Flags, Disney, or whatever it is, it's up there. I think it's Six Flags. Anyway, far outside of town, right? Um, you would think that there'd be campgrounds right in Los Angeles that you could just snuggle into. But those, if there are campgrounds, they're filled up with people that live there full time, right? They pay monthly just to live in their camper in LA, which, hey, if that's what you're into. I lived in Los Angeles for a few years, um, so I'm not picking on LA. Walmart lets you park an RV overnight, but not all do. Um, so you have to, I would absolutely, unless you see the parking lot's full of tractor trailers and other RVs pull in, you know, you're fine for a night or two or three, maybe, uh, if it's just you, right. If you pull in there in a Walmart parking lot, it's, it's, there's no other, anybody else has parked there. You probably can park there, go inside and talk to the manager and say, Hey, listen, is it okay if we, if we just kind of park on the edge over there overnight, we've got a camper out in the, in the, and I've never had anybody say no. They might have a sign up that says no overnight night parking. I'd still go inside and ask. You, you, you know, it's worth trying. What questions? Homewoods, yeah, Homewood Suites are pretty good. Good. Any place that's got a breakfast and does dinners and things. Um, I'll tell you this: if you're used to going to a hotel and having room service, uh, you don't. They don't. The hotels you're going to stay at for doing cat work, they don't have room service. They and they'll have the breakfast is like powdered eggs and like, uh, or they'll have like bagels. They have toast and cereal. And then a little cooler that's got a tray with hard boiled eggs in it, which is what I always get. And then little tiny like milks, like when you were in school and with the straw. Okay, Sean asks, on subject of hotel monthly rates, have you ever booked for the month and then had to leave three weeks? Do you lose that last week? Uh, I think one time I did. Out of all of the time, it's, it's, I mean, 20 years of, of doing cat work, one, I think one time out of that, and it was somebody who was just 
they just dug their heels in and they were being a jerk about it. Um, th- everybody else is like, yeah, no problem. Usually the person behind the counter is pretty cool and they'll just be like, okay, you know, you're good to go, right? And then you, you get your big, huge receipt and you jump in the truck and you drive to your next storm. So um, I, generally speaking, I'm not, I have not, the question is basically, have, do you have to eat like a whole week of hotel? And no, I haven't really ever had that happen except for once. I'll tell you this on sketch. If you like in a lot of places in Florida, if you think of, if you think about a crosscut of socioeconomic crosscut of America, like there's you know a small percentage up here who have live in great big houses, five thousand square foot houses with crazy roofs, right? Then there's a slightly bigger piece that live in s- smaller houses, and then there's a great big, huge chunk of people that live in one story ranches with four twelve pitched roofs on them. In the vast majority of the country. Florida in particular, I don't, my experience working in places like Florida along the coast is a lot of one story buildings um, if it's not on stilts, right? Um, so if you're inside, you're outside of the flood zone, usually it's one story everything, which makes it really easy. And if you get on, if you find a roof that's like, I'll, I'll post that link out if you guys want. Um, if you're looking at a house that's got a roof like this, Right. If you buy an eagle view on that, I'm going to come find you and slap you in the face because that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight super fast measurements. Right. Why would you pay 40 bucks for it would take you literally probably three minutes, like three actual minutes. Not like, you know, it's so fast. It's like just a few minutes. It'd be like three, literally you time it out three minutes to, to, to do that. Right. I don't know why you'd spend money on it to do that. Super easy, super duper. And then do, doing that in sketch, drop down this roof, right? You guys have done this and then put a break right there and then click control, click and drag out your little, this guy, right? done it's like two it's like two or three clicks don't get an eagle view on that don't do it it's a waste of money waste of time because you have to sit there and wait for the eagle view to come down and if you if you have a habit of doing that and you get into a neighborhood where there's a lot of great big gigantic uh mature trees then you're not going to get eagle views and you're going to have to do this so it's better to get practice doing it and save your money right I get eagle views on houses that are uh, super complex and I don't want to spend all day long up there like measuring every little thing and climbing all over the place and getting this little jut out over here or whatever. Um, and also ones that are super dangerous that are just, are, you know, my chances of dying are super high on it. I'm 40 bucks for my life is, you know, mitigating emotional toll. I'll, I'll take a couple more uh, questions and then we'll kind of wrap this up at the, sort of around the two hour mark. If that's cool with everybody. If you have, Questions after this, um, if this, I'll, it's just real quick before anybody like takes off. Um, what I'm, my plan is, is that if, if Dorian uh, m- does make landfall and it does make a great big mess and it's like people, everybody's going, um, I'll do a, another one of these after that to talk more about like um, time management stuff. We'll, we'll go into like, you know, kind of how you should set up your schedule um, so that you're, just trust me on this. Like the time is like the, the thing, right? You can be good at Xactimate. You can be, you know, know everything that there is to know about molding and cabinets. But if you can't manage your time, you're going to be gone. It's it's just a simple fact. And some people like, to, like I was saying about the, the staff people, they're used to being on salary and having like, you know, well, I could just, I just need to do two today. I mean, I'm going to get paid the same amount. You get paid for every single claim that you turn in, right? So you want to make sure that every one of those claims that you turn in is a good claim that stays closed. You don't get paid if that, that claim is closed. And the more time you, you have to mess around with the corrections and stuff, the longer it takes for that claim to do. And then it's then that's when you start to get behind. And when you get too far behind, catching up is like... So uh, after this thing, we see what this thing does, um, I will go into that in, in uh, a lot more detail. And we'll do a Q&A about it. Because when you guys get on site, you're going to have a lot more questions that you don't have right now because you just don't know what you don't know. Um, so emotional toll, <clears throat> your job, right? This is the carrier or the insurance company. 
And this is the insured, which you might see abbreviated like that, right? They have a relationship, right? This person has a house and they want this person to help them protect it, right? So to give them money, this is insurance 101. They, and they give them money in exchange for a promise that when something happens to their house or their property, that they will take care of it, less the deductible, and within the constraints of the policy, right? Um, you don't want to do anything to break this relationship, right? So there's no such thing as adjusting for the insured or adjusting for the carrier, okay? You hear people talk about that. Well, you know, do you adjust for the insured or do you adjust for the carrier? Basically meaning, do you... Are you a tight ass on the estimating guidelines and you're like, you're just like holding back the money because you know you're trying to save money for them, which don't ever do it? Or you've got the floodgates open and you're just writing for ah, let's put that in there too, right? And you're just giving these guys whatever they want, right? Do not do either one of those things. Your job is to maintain and support the relationship between the insured and the carrier, which means that. You do everything to the, you do everything to the letter. I mean, you, you, but you do it in a way that it has compassion for the insured, right? That policy is a contract between them. If the insured didn't read it and they don't understand it, it's your job to help them understand it, right? Well, why isn't that covered? Why do I pay insurance for anyway? If I had it, a dollar for every time I heard that, well, I actually have had a dollar for every time I heard that, and it's been a lot of dollars, right? Why do I even have insurance anyway? Explain to them simple terms, not like, well, you know, you have to put yourself in that person's shoes, right? So, the key to mitigating the emotional toll in these situations is to have empathy, right? Be a friendly face for them. Um, a really, really big thing that's going to help is keeping the lines of communication open at all times. Let that person know and, and back it up, but with action, let them know that they can get in touch with you during these hours these days or any time, whatever you want to say, whatever works for your schedule, right? But set an expectation, right? Um, when you say you're going to do something, you say you're going to call them with their numbers or a decision about something that you had to go to a manager for or whatever, you're going to call them back by five o'clock tomorrow, you call them back at four o'clock or two o'clock or call them back today if you can get the answer, right? So you set an expectation and you exceed that expectation. That will go light years towards helping you with tough conversations that you're going to have to have with insurance because there are a lot of things that aren't covered that policy is what it is right a lot of stuff all the language in the policy isn't created by the carrier it's created by case law right it's created by statutory decisions like the legislators get together and they say you know with influence from uh consumer groups and from the insurance industry they'll come and they'll say we want this piece of legislation because it benefits us or these guys will say this, whatever. So the, the policy is not just like the carrier just made it up um, and that's what they get, right? It's it's something that's been growing and kind of living and breathing a little bit. And there's a lot of things that add to the policy and a lot of things that take away from the policy. So you have to understand the policy, right? Um, but you can't deviate from it. You can't just because you feel bad that that person isn't going to get any money, give them money, right? Um, this is kind of a long way of saying that if you can find, like, for, say, for example, the insured has surface water, right? And water came, comes into this, this woman's basement. She's got a finished basement. And uh, she has a whole bunch of stuff down there that's valuable to her, right? Um, but there's no, co there's no covered cause of loss, right? Surface water. Water came into the wall or poured in. You know, hit the, when rain hits the ground, it becomes surface water, and it's not covered, right? So it's, that pours into the window comes into the walls, up to the floor, whatever. <clears throat> it's not, you know, we'll just leave it at that. It's not covered, right? Don't just walk down there. Or like, you know, sh you, you'll see notes on the, on the notes of loss, right, that say, you know, insured had uh, rainwater come in through the wall, right? You probably know that that's probably not going to be covered. If you have the attitude, and this is kind of the core of the answer, I think, to your question. If you have the attitude that it's not going to be covered, and you're kind of building yourself up for like having a hard conversation with this insured, or you're acting like, you know, 
some people will say, I've, I've had insurance tell me this, that, well, the adjuster seemed to have made up uh, her mind before she even got here, right? You don't want to have somebody say that about you. So to support this relationship, when you go to this person's house, and this, and this may be an old woman who lives by herself, she doesn't have your family, she's, she's alone, right? To have compassion for this person because it could be you, you know? Um, or you may know somebody that is in that situation. Um, but either way, even if it's a, a young family or the guy's got a Mercedes parked in the driveway, same thing, right? You support, you want to support this relationship. So when you go to that house, your attitude isn't, you know, walking around, you know, kind of half-assed taking pictures because you know you're going to have to deny it or you think you're going to have to deny it. You walk in with an attitude of, I'm going to investigate this loss because the insured may have been confused. They may not have understood where the water really came from. They don't know, right? They may have looked down, opened up the door and looked down in the basement and saw water splashing around and assumed it just came in through the walls. They have no idea. They may have come out of the toilet that was down there and that may be covered, right? You investigate that loss. You have the attitude that I'm going to go to that person's house and I'm going to try to find coverage, you know, within the constraints of the estimating guidelines and the policy and the rules that have been set down for me. I'm not going to cheat and lie and try to guide them into saying something so that I can pay for it. Like, well, are you sure, you know, if you tell me that it came out of the toilet, then we can pay. Do not do that. That's fraud straight up. Right. And don't go the other way and be like, you know, well, you know, if you didn't see where the water came from, you know, I kind of have to assume that it came through the wall because that's what you said initially. Right. If they don't know, you may have to give them the benefit of the doubt and you may have to get an expert out there to help figure it out. A plumber might be able to come out and figure it out. I don't know. I mean, who knows? But if you, if they don't know at all and you can't prove that it didn't come from a covered source, call your manager and say, hey, listen, I got one. The, the note, here's the claim number. The notes say uh, it, the insured thinks it came through the wall. They never went into the basement because they're 97 years old and they're not going downstairs. They just opened the door and saw water and they assumed it came in through the wall. Um, but there's a toilet down there and there's a floor drain and they have a sump pump endorsement or they've got, you know, whatever. Um, what can we do about that? She never saw where the water came from, right? Your manager might say, you know, let me get with the carrier and see what we, if we can do something, right? That is your job. It's not to go out and be like, I, I can't tell you the number of reinspections I've done where people have, have mishandled claims like this because they got worked up about having to do a denial and it overlooked something and we ended up paying for it. And it's happened when I was a staff adjuster, it happened a lot that IAs would do that. They go, they breeze through the house and deny it, you know, and I end up going back to the house and writing $125,000 check to the insured because it was covered, right? Because of the, everything was ruined. Um, so investigate the loss, right? Have that attitude. And when you go to that house, this is, this is where the emotional toll part comes in. That insured will see that you are trying to find a way to pay for it. Even if you're not saying, I'm trying to find a way to pay for this, which you shouldn't say, but you're thinking it and you're acting like it, right? You're explaining, are you sure, you know, you're looking around the, the outside of the house or maybe you're looking, to, was there a hole in the roof? And it could be that water came in through the attic and there's a, they've got a water heater in a closet that they never opened. And you see like the drywall's all falling down and it went straight through down to the basement. And that's where the water came in. 100% covered, pay for it. Here's your check, right? Insured may not have even seen that. You look in every closet, you're looking around, you spend extra time with those people. And you, you say, when you finally get to the end, if you can't pay for it, if there's no, if it's cut and dried, there's no gray area, there's no like benefit of the doubt, there's no way that you can work with the carrier to help do something for them. You have to deny that claim. You say, you know, you, you probably spent 45 minutes looking around the house, you know, and you're talking to the insured, like, well, what about over here? You know, let's take a look at this. Well, it's possible that it could have done da da because if they don't know where it came from, right? Then finally, you just, they're going to get the idea that it's probably not going to be covered anyway. And when they call the claim in, their agent may have said, well, it sounds like that may, be, it may not be covered. Let's have an adjuster take a look at it anyway. They may already know that it may not be covered, right? So you're getting all worked up about having this conversation for nothing, right? Um, we finally break the news to them to say, listen, you know, um, I've looked, you know, I've, I've, the source of the water, um, you know, is we, we, ruled out everything else it could possibly be. And there you're with me, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, the policy explicitly excludes uh, any damage caused by water that comes from this source. As soon as rain hits the ground, it's, it's considered to be surface water. It comes in through the wall. It's not covered. It's considered to be kind of like flood. And the only 
group or entity or whatever that covers flood is the federal government and you're not in a flood zone. So um, unfortunately, I won't be able to do anything for you today. However, here are a couple things that you can do, right? Number one, and I'm going to do this, especially if it's a 97-year-old woman. I'm going to write an estimate for her. I'm going to scope that loss and I'm going to write the whole thing out, right? You, there's a some companies have a, have a header for you that will say, "This is not a fine. This is not. We're not paying this. Your claim was not covered. We're doing this as a courtesy, right? So that when they hire a restoration company, they can go, you know, well, my adjuster, you know, it says it's going to be this much, or they can take what the restoration company or Surf Pro, whoever, comes out and gives them and hold it up against what I said and say, you know, okay, we're good to go, right? If they have to pay this. The other thing is, is that unreimbursed or unpaid or denied insurance claims may be deductible uh, under certain circumstances um, from your taxes. I tell people I say that and I say, I'm not a tax uh, professional. Um, you absolutely, I don't know if it's, this is if it'll work for you or not. Talk to H&R Block. If you've got an account, talk to them, ask them. No matter what I say, Anything that you do in that basement, you know, if you buy supplies from Walmart, you buy a bunch of Windex and, you know, bleach and a mop and all that stuff. If you rent fans or if you buy a box fan, a dehumidifier or whatever, keep track of all, keep all those receipts. If people come and help you, like your friends and neighbors and your kids and grandkids and they all come down and everybody's mopping and whatever, make a list of everybody that's there on what day, how many hours they worked. Because you can take that to your tax guy and that's how they're going to, how that's how they're going to figure out how much you can deduct off your taxes if you can. The other thing is, is that in, uh, sometimes FEMA will get involved. Um, I've had a couple of big storms in St. Louis with one in Milwaukee. FEMA gets involved. And if they have something like that, um, they can take that to FEMA, right? Or in the case of the, one of the St. Louis storms, um, the, the city's uh, like sewer drain system was terrible shape it was just it, it was the re, it was the reason why everybody's basements flooded it said keep track of this stuff i can't pay for it um but uh hang on to this so that when you know if there's something that the city ends up doing you've got the documentation of your expenses so that they can know how much to give you if they can right you're always if you know so you're trying to find ways to help them out i will go even farther and say to anybody i'll say listen um later on if you have any questions or if a contractor comes out here and he finds an obvious source of this that he thinks may be covered, call me back, right? And I'm emphatic about it. I'm going to talk to people. I'm like, just like I'm talking to you right now. I'm like, call me back. I've got my cell phone number. It's right here on the sheet. Da, 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 da. Um, because if, if there's a way we can find to cover this, we absolutely want to try to, right? I'm trying to help, right? This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to support this relationship right here. This is, this is the most important thing. And I think when you think about denying claims you're having tough conversations and things aren't covered or whatever look a little bit a little bit at the big picture have some empathy and think of ways that you can kind of you can soften the blow with this kind of thing the tax thing um the tax thing i don't know like i've had an unreimbursed like medical expenses for an insurance claim and it didn't work on my taxes i don't know but i think there was like a limit i didn't reach the limit um so it's it's that's a fuzzy thing. I, I give it to people um, in case, right? And they need to talk to a tax person about it anyway. That's absolutely true, Steve. A certain number of people are going to be uh, complete jerks for no reason. In fact, and this is what makes that so bad. It's not common, right? Two things that just are not common. Number one's fraud. I don't see it very often. You do When you see it, it's like, it's so obvious. You're just like, what kind of a dummy would do this? And number two is people who are like just jerks, right? And sometimes it, it almost doesn't matter what you do on the claim, right? Like I had a woman um, who everything that she, she, her claim was perfect. Like she had everything that she needed. She probably even had maybe accidentally a little bit of extra. Um, the contractor, we, he, he and I agreed perfectly on everything. It wasn't even a very big claim. She called me up at nine o'clock at night on Friday and chewed me up one side and down the other. I can't even remember what it was about, but she was yelling, screaming, calling me all kinds of names. Even though I had a, had a conversation with her that afternoon where I said, everything's totally taken care of. The only thing that's out of your pocket is your 250 deductible. You're good to go. 
I don't know. Some, it, this is this is my attitude on this. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to be nice to everybody, even if the guy's screaming in my face. And here's why. Because if any of you have ever, like, broken an ankle or you've, like, tweaked your neck and, like, for two days, like, you're, it just hurts. Like, you can't turn your head left or whatever. It hurts. Like, it's like a spike of pain. Or you have migraines or you got headaches. If you have any kind of chronic pain, you know that you're not yourself, right? You're like, it's not, your your adrenaline's up. You feel like it's painful, right? When you're out doing claims and you're out in the flat, full cross section of humanity in the United States, you're going to run across people who are like super fit, CrossFit guys and gals, and they're bouncing out the door, you know, like, you know, go ahead and do whatever. And then other people who have really bad, severe chronic pain that have medical issues that cause them to not be themselves. That guy yells in my face. I don't know. He, he, he Maybe he just found out that his wife has terminal cancer, right? And he's just taking it out on me. Do not take anything personal at all. Just don't do it. I don't care what the names they call you. Um, if they threaten you with physical violence, you just stop talking immediately. You're mid-sentence. Stop talking. Grab your stuff, turn around, jump in your car and drive away. You, you are no longer required to be at that house if somebody likes says, I want to knock your you know, tooth out, buddy. Just turn around and leave. You don't have to be there for that. Um, and in, in a lot of, if somebody gets like super, like super aggressive and super like you feel like you're, th you, you feel threatened in any way, stop talking. No more talking. Don't finish what you're saying. Just shut it. Jump in your truck. And drive away. Call your manager. I, I probably call the agent first. Uh, no, I call it call your manager, and then he may tell you to call the agent, or he may call your agent, their agent, and because that person, if they're like, have lost their mind over something, whatever it is, the first next first person they're going to call is their agent, right? So you want to have the agent not be getting, hey, this is Joe Bob's agency, and have their phone like screaming at him, right? With if they don't, if they're not prepared for it, you want agents to be your friend. That's a whole other webinar. So I know, but I, it's, it's not often that people, in the beginning when I didn't, I didn't know what I just told you. Sure. Yeah. If people, people feel like they, uh, if they feel like you don't know what you're doing, um, they may be more inclined to like kind of just be dismissive or if they're inclined to being angry, they may be angry with you. Um, uh, which is why I do not talk. I, I, I tell people just keep your mouth shut, take notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. I understand. Sure. Write it down. Don't be like, don't try to like debate with never debate with people does you'll lose especially if it's contract you just just don't you can do what you can do you can't do what you can't do right yeah ken that's yeah that's what i just said that lady um you have insurance that'll rip your new one when you do pay for all the damages we don't know why it just is what it is you got to have some thick skin um angie i wouldn't be i mean i i'm i'm not a woman i've, I've never experienced being a woman um thankfully because i'm a guy and it'd be weird but I have been in a couple situations where I did feel that physical violence could occur and mouth shut, turn around and is, you know, extracting myself as, as quickly without like triggering like a prey response, like a bear, you know, um, getting and just getting out and just leaving. Um, it, it's again, it's, it's not that common. Um, if you're talking to somebody on the phone, you're setting up an appointment and they sound, they give you a weird vibe on the phone. Maybe uh, if you've got an adjuster friend that's on your storm with you or your spouse is with you, just take them with you. Yeah, you just have somebody have some backup there. Um, you know, at the minimum, you might call your manager and say, um, "Just want to let you know that I'm going to be at these, you know, appointments today, and uh, uh, I've got one that I kind of have a weird vibe about. I think it'll be okay, but I'm going to check in with you in two hours. If I don't check in with you, call me or you know whatever or whatever. I mean, you can do things like that. And I would talk to you may, that's, that's kind of a, Angie, that's kind of a question or a sort of a thing for when you go into the certification courses, when you're in orientation, ask about that because they'll have, there'll be resources for that because not all adjusters are guys, um, obviously. I mean, a lot of us are, but not all of us. And, and everybody's safety is more important than, than anything else. Okay. You know, the hurricane's going to do what it's going to do. I got Max is, is uh, if he's not there, he's almost there. Um, he's driving down there. He's going to try and get on the beach and do the whole like, you know, Jim Cantori thing with the wind and all that stuff. So look for some, some videos like that. Um, if you have more questions about uh, if, if you want some more some deeper 
training on like, especially the time management stuff or what to do as a new person. The book that I've got on my website is, um, it's a pretty good resource. And I think that it's, a lot of people in here have, have read the book. The book was designed to help guys and gals, like just like you, if you're going to deploy on a storm and you have limited experience and you don't have a whole, whole lot or any experience doing claims, the book will help you because it's got a full like calendar in there and it tells you what to do when. Um, the course goes into great detail on that stuff, um, but it's entirely up to you guys. So anyway, um, thank you so much for being here. This is super awesome. And uh, have a great weekend and we'll uh, catch you on the next one. Hopefully there'll be a next one. I think that's the longest video I've done yet. So if you're still watching this right now, thank you so much. Question of the day. Are you brand new to this industry and want to know more about what an independent adjuster is? Check out adjustertv.com start to learn more and get started with your licensing, Xactimate training, and get on the path to becoming a successful IA. And if you got value from this video, you can help me create more videos just like this by subscribing to Adjuster TV on YouTube. Wondering what to watch next? There are tons more videos right here on the Adjuster TV YouTube channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great storm.